So we are uh, talking about how to talk to admissions this cycle. And if you are joining in or if you're watching this recording from Kajabi, I just wanted to give everyone a heads up that this will be sort of an all encompassing sort of beginner's guide to how to talk about uh, admissions and, and what to talk about. I know uh, I'm a first generation uh, will be law student. And when I was first, people were talking about contacting admissions and asking them questions. I had no idea what people were even talking about. So since that then, I have conducted three one-on-one -on -one interviews with admissions officers myself, director of admissions, Jonathan Glick from University of Maryland, Cary School of Law, uh, recruiter for Texas Tech University School of Law, Sean Adams, and UCLA's Dean of Admissions, Rob Schwartz. So within all of that, that time of me starting out and not having any idea of how people are talking to admissions, what they're asking them, doing research myself and having conversations with myself, I wanted to share sort of information with you and what I've been learning along the way. And what's, what's really great is, uh, if you don't know me, my name is Alyssa. I'm a consultant and also a TA with LSAT Unplugged. Uh, and I'm excited to share some of the things that I've been learning with you. I was just talking with Ayaka about how I have been talking about admissions and talking about cycles and applying and best practices for over eight, eight months consistently now. And something that I have learned is that there's the more research I do, the more questions I have. So keep that in mind. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Font is extra big on this uh, particular document so that anybody looking at my screen share, it's nice and large there. So uh, for those new to the process. So what we're going to talk about tonight is why you should reach out to admissions, how to reach out. Uh, this is in terms of level of formality, tone that you're going to use when you write them an email, and the structure of how you write an email to someone who is very busy and uh, looking at a lot of different applications. I'm also gonna talk about when is the best time to reach out and what to ask them. Some ideas and things that you can ask them that I didn't even know about at the beginning of my process and I've just learned. So first things first, why people think that reaching out to admissions is important. I hear a lot of this and I heard a lot of it and it caused stress and a pressure within me when I first started to think about applying to law school. You need to write, people say, you need to write to admission so that they will remember me. They'll remember you. You need to create this relationship building with an admissions officer so that they remember you when your application comes through. They might also say, it'll make me look good. I want to look better when my application comes through. You might say, I have to show my interest in the school or I'll move higher up, like maybe like in the application process or all of these thoughts come through. After lots of research, what I found out is why reaching out to admissions is actually important. The number one most important part is that you as an applicant are more informed. If you're having mature, honest conversations about what you're looking for in a program and what they have to offer, and if it's truly a good fit, you will be able to make a better decision when accepting an offer. Switching the script a little bit from I'm doing X, Y, Z. For example, even being a TA and LSAT unplugged, uh, the language flipping the script from this makes me look good on my resume to wow, in this position, I have access to resources that are making me smarter when it comes to my decision-making process. Law school is very expensive and I want a really healthy generation coming out of law school. That's what I would love to see. So it's gonna make you more informed. Another reason why reaching out to admissions is going to be really important is that you're going to get into the practice of having conversations when you need something. And if there's something I've been learning from talking to admissions officers, they are constantly bringing up the point of leveraging professors. When you're in school, leveraging office hours, developing relationships with 
for example, developing relationships with professors that have connections to courthouses, maybe if, if I'm speaking correctly, um, in the region, maybe some professors know of an internship of, uh, opportunity. That relationship building may or may not be competitive, more competitive than not, depending on what type of school you go to, what school you go to, but having conversations with people when you need something is a difficult art form. And the more that you get into the practice of it now, the better you're going to be off. Uh, and you owe it to yourself to put some thought into these conversations and these big decisions you're making. Again, flipping the script from, I hope that they take me, I have to look good. I want to make myself look good to I'm interested in this and I'm not afraid to ask questions. One of the biggest takeaways I had with my uh, UCLA assistant dean of admissions with Rob Schwartz is he really made it clear that if you have a question, you need to ask it. If you are thinking about something, it is always better to reach out to admissions. I want to see a healthy law school uh, incoming class generation that is informed and as assertive when, and kind when it comes to speaking to admissions officers. Reddit, the internet, friendship, conversations, none of it is a replacement for speaking with an admissions officer. So whenever you feel yourself uh, Ayaka and I actually were just having a very authentic conversation between each other as friends. And we're talking about schools and decisions that we're trying to make that could potentially impact the rest of our lives. And at one point in the conversation, we looked at each other and we we're like, wait, let's put a pin in this because the conversation needed to move out of the realm between two friends struggling and having like a good authentic talk. Like we need to take these questions to people that uh, their entire job is to answer these questions. So uh, you really owe it to yourself to have these conversations. Stop looking at um, you know random internet resources and just uh, show up for yourself powerfully. And something that I have learned, Ayaka, do you have? Yes, um, just one point here, and I'm sorry to interrupt. You know, you talk about how you know we want to show up powerfully, thoughtfully to admissions. And, you know, that might be one goal for someone to reach out to admissions. The reverse is true. If you're reaching out with very mis like information that you can find on the internet and you're asking admissions those questions, that's also going to show up unpowerfully and it will make the same mark, just not in the positive context that you want it to be. So you don't want to willy nilly reach out to admissions, you want to have a thoughtful conversation. So really think about those questions and maybe you can find a partial answer um, to your question, but the one step further is something that you need to ask admissions. So kind of think about what you're asking, think about why you're reaching out to admissions. Um, and part of that conversation that Alyssa just alluded to between she and I, you know, that was something that I needed to process with Alyssa first. And then Alyssa was like, you need to talk to admissions. And it's like, yep, you're right. <laughs> I need to do that. So, you know, it is a process of like getting to what, what you do need to ask admissions, what you should ask admissions. Anyway, I yield. <laughs> you know, what is a really exciting conversation that anybody, if you stop this video right now and you think to yourself, I don't have 45 more minutes to spend with this person talking. I want you to just land this point that the best conversations with an admissions officer are conversations where you have a lot of self-knowledge. And what I mean by that is, is bouncing off of Ayaka's idea just now, for me and for a lot of people that I meet starting at the law school admissions ap application process, it is very overwhelming. And the ideas of what you might think to ask are definitely in the FAQ sections of the internet. But where the real magic comes through when people are kind of up here in this land of, I need them to remember me, I need to look good, all of that can happen naturally if you come to the table with really well-informed questions. If you're like me and you're asking yourself, I don't even know a good question to ask, my best advice and what I really want to land is that the more you know yourself, the more you can ask an, a very personalized question. And so if you do more research on yourself, the easiest way to start with that is your numbers. 
figure out send your transcript into LSAC really early and call, call LSAC at once your transcript is in and say, am I reading my GPA correctly? Can you tell me what the, cause LSAC, uh, you know, looks at your uh, GPA and calculates it in a different way than maybe identical, identically to the way your transcript has. Get your numbers in your hand, start PTing. If it's too early for you to have your numbers and you haven't been PTing yet, get to know yourself in other ways, which is actually what I'm going to bring up uh, with here. The more you know yourself, the more you can ask a question that can't be answered on an FAQ because when you have a conversation with an admissions officer, you wanna, ask, you wanna say, I'm gonna just say like my mind straight up. Like for example, I'm currently living in the like, in Texas, this is where I grew up. So I'm here for the for the pandemic. This is where all my family contacts are. So when I think long term, I'm thinking like really long term for the rest of my life. It might be smart of me to think about if I would need to practice in Texas. Do I need to practice with my law degree in Texas? This is where everybody is. This is where my support system is. I also spent ten years living in California. So I want to get back to California. I need to figure out if the schools I'm applying to have alumni presence in either one of those states so that I could potentially have more of a network there. This is like a really weird kind of like integral conversation to have. So looking into the ABA required, you know, output of the schools, looking into where their alumni are, looking into those situations. That is a starting point for the way I can start to shape and tailor my conversations with admissions officers. I might say, I noticed that you have X percent of alumni working in Texas, you know, and, and just kind of start conversations there. This is not a perfect script. I'm just talking about how to tailor it to yourself. All right. So this is just a little FYI, showing interest and in visiting law schools does not necessarily equate higher priority for admissions officers. Uh, a lot of people, uh, but it does put you in a more informed place to decide where you are going to spend your time and money. So big question, when do I visit schools? Do I visit schools before I apply? Do I visit schools after I get accepted? I hear this differently on YouTube videos, University of Michigan, Dean Z. Uh, as she calls herself, uh, it's a great YouTube channel. If you haven't looked it up, look up the YouTube channel, U University of Michigan Law, DNZ. She's got a great vlog, very informative. She says expli explicitly, don't visit a law school until after you've been accepted. Other people, including Sean Adams of Texas Tech University, she has a personalized story that you can also find on YouTube where she talks about she was accepted to two separate, uh, she was trying to figure out what schools she wanted to go to. She visited one school and it didn't float her boat. That's not her words, those are mine. She goes to another school and is, she had a warm, welcoming experience and that's where she wanted to go to school. And to follow up on your story, Alyssa, I, I spoke to admissions dean Jason Glick from um, University of Maryland, um, and he also reflected um, the the idea that you really don't need to visit a school until you, until you've been accepted. So it is a little bit of a different process in undergrad, and people. Don't, I didn't know that until he said that. So uh, I was like, I didn't know this. Um. And you know, what's really interesting is that there is, I think that on, on, I think that out in the open, it's very obvious that visiting a school or paying money to fly out to visit a school and show interest uh, does not make you a higher priority candidate. Uh, spending money on the school, uh, things like that should not and do not make you a, a, a more prioritized candidate. So I just don't want anyone to go off of that or to be thinking that that's something that's necessary for them to do to vis physically spend money to visit the school. Some schools do have like uh, allowances after you, I think it's after you've been accepted, but it's, it's, it's varied with COVID. Every school is different, but spending money to go visit or travel a school does not put you in a higher prioritized place in terms of admissions. So when 
but you want to know what talking to admissions does do is it makes you a better and more knowledgeable person about this huge decision that you are making. So when is a good time to reach out to admissions? After you've done some light research, okay, not necessary, but absolutely suggested. I brought it up earlier, location, where do you want to work? Okay, so don't uh, try it. If you are looking into a T14 school or a higher ranked school, uh, it has been said that, that that school probably has a stronger alum so, uh, presence, maybe elsewhere, maybe more connections to work, but make sure that wherever you're really looking in to go to school, look at the region, look at the location. If you want to stay where you are, again, ask yourself what kinds of presence, what kind of presence is already there surrounding the school. For example, University of Maryland, Cary School of Law is around three major courthouses, government offices, and uh, uh, I think nationally recognized law firms. So those are completely different lines of work and that's what's surrounding University Carey School of Law, University of Maryland Carey School of Law, so sorry, excuse me. So what's around the school? That would be one of the best things to look at just right off the bat. What is, are there courthouses? Are there law firms? Uh, talk to an admissions officer and, and or look at the ABA uh, dis required disclosures and see where are those students working during the summer? Where is everyone working during the summer? If it's a school in a competitive area or this would be a really great place to start if it's a school in an area that has more than one law school. For example, Los Angeles has multiple law schools in the Los Angeles region. Where are those students spending their summers? Is it competitive between one school and another school opportunities? Uh, these are all things to think about. Uh, you know, have you given the thought of how you're going to pay off your debts? And the reason that I ask this is because it's a great conversation to have with admissions officers. How many people in second semester of 1L are holding down jobs? You know, I, wouldn't, I would not recommend working in first semester of 1L uh, to anybody, but uh, there's different ways to pay off your debts. For example, if you're going into public, uh, working for public sort of uh, public rights, human rights, or uh, some sort of public program. There are student loan forgiveness programs. Maybe you could look at the ABA requirements or figure out how many students coming out of that school are actually partaking in that sort of program where their, uh, their loans are going to be forgiven in 10 years. Some people work through law school. Now, everybody is different, but you, I want everyone to sort of imagine what kind of law student they'll be. Um, I personally hear different, very nuanced, please don't just take my ideas and run with it, but very nuanced of sort of a seesaw effect of I'll speak to some people that say, it was a priority of mine to get the highest grades in my class because the people who had the highest grades were funneled into working in more corporate law opportunities straight out of the school. If your priority is higher grades, you may not may not be able to have work, work during school. And so if you're thinking, I want to go into corporate law, you might imagine yourself being an extremely competitive academic. If you're looking into going into corporate law and you're going to be an extremely competitive academic, if you go to a higher ranked school, there's going to be more competition there with those students. It's, it's all sort of a, a dance. Can you compete? Or would you go to the highest ranked school and have to compete with other students who have gone to that highest ranked score, school and try to go into corporate law? It's... Um, I'm not trying to scare anyone. And of course, anything is possible, but these are all things to think about. For example, her name is Rachel G. She wrote a book called The Law Career Playbook. If I'm saying it correctly, you can look it up on Amazon. She has interviews with Steve Schwartz. She went to a very small, lesser known school called Southwestern Law School. And it's in Los Angeles. And she writes in her book that people would laugh at her, almost saying it's not a real school but she had a six figure corporate salary job. Uh, so she brings up a really great point of how you can have any job out of any school, but if you are planning into going into corporate law, you need to think about if you can 
really compete with the other students that would be there. That's why I ask you, have you really given thought to how you're gonna pay off your debts? If you wanna work during school, then you may not be the number one person in your class in terms of grades, but you will gain other skill sets so that when you graduate, you can have on your resume, I have all these skill sets, and then that would create a plan for how you plan to pay off your debts. So those are questions and conversations that you could be having with admissions officers planning out like that. And then having continuing on con uh, conversations with the student affairs officers, which is who it switches to the point of contact when you're actually in school. Alyssa, this is this is awesome. And I, and I love this attention to like how you're going to pay off, you know, the debt, um, you know, if you're going to work. And I think this really applies to people who are looking to go to school, not this coming fall, but the next fall. But what are some skills, credentials you can get, you know, that you can use when you're working part time, maybe just one or two hours a week. Um, for example, for myself, I have an AFA, a -F -A -A credential for group fitness. That's an hour out of my week that I teach. And, you know, it, in high demand. And um, when I used to teach um, at a school, that was 50 bucks in your pocket for a week um, for teaching one hour, right? So it's, you know, kind of getting these credentials that can boost that hourly rate to help you during your law school years, maybe. Are, are you saying having like, a, I don't want to call it like a side hustle during school? Sure. Yeah. Why, yeah, you know, if it's something that you, you know, if you're working, let's say not minimum wage, but $10 an hour, right? 50 bucks is five hours of work compared to having a credential that, you know, takes, it's a one, two day workshop, then, and you can boost that to $50 an hour. That's- I see what great, you're saying. Yeah, I, that's a great I, side hustle. Yeah, that is a really good side hustle to have. But, you know, also speak to an admissions officer and ask them if you can get in touch with a student. Absolutely. And have that conversation with students. And, you know, actually just for anyone that's listening in on this conversation and is starting to think about, are they going to prioritize grades to mm -hmm. try to funnel themselves into maybe, for example, a corporate internship yeah. uh, or a clerk, a clerkship? which would require uh, fantastic relationships potentially with professors? Absolutely. Or are you going to do really, really well with your grades, but also work, which would not potentially perfectly or guarantee you to be funneled into corporate law or a clerkship? Potentially, this is all I'm talking completely. There's so much nuance here. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know something, Ayaka, that was brought up to me, I was in an informational interview with a woman who was is a lawyer. She's a practicing in-house lawyer in New York City. Mm -hmm. And she mentioned, you know, it might be more beneficial to your career to take on work through a professor or to take on internships and leave behind the, you know, for example, side hustles that that could potentially show up more powerfully once you graduate. So Absolutely. if somebody, you know, so I see her, sometimes I think everybody is different, but talking to admissions officers about what sorts of opportunities are available for work for mm -hmm. someone in the second semester of their 1L. Like that's a pretty pointed question, uh, you know, to, to even talk about, are there job offer, offers for the summer post yeah. 1L for high performing 1Ls. You know, what does that look like? And I think that would be great if, if you know what area of law you're interested in to ask a super pointed question about that area of law um, because you don't get that from a general stats from, from the website, right? Like it's, they're not gonna say people in family law get X, you know, go to X, Y, and Z firm. That, that's really not what's on the stats on a yeah. website. So really be pointed, really ask for the details. Um, definitely have that conversation with an admissions officer. So 
Yeah. And in my mind, just so everyone knows why we're still looking at this screen, everything that Ayaka and I have talked about so far has been just straight up geographically. If you are planning on going to a school that's outside of the realm of where you currently live and currently plan to stay, are you going to spend your summer there? Are you going to stay there, you know, to, to work on certain things or it's okay. You don't have to be, I'm not trying to tell anyone that you have to spend your summer there, but looking at how you are going to manage your finances in terms of working during school or prioritizing your grades in school. And if you're planning on prioritizing your grades in school, I would suggest make sure that you, that is a realistic goal for yourself and that school. I'm trying to just balance out rankings versus job opportunities versus uh, ge geographically where you're looking to go and what that kind of pool looks like. So this is how you would reach out to admissions officers. Uh, be kind, be direct, make your intention as clear as possible, uh, clear as quickly as possible. Uh, have a goal if that fits into the conversation. It would be fantastic if you wanted to reach out to an admissions officer and say, hi, my name is this, uh, you know, I have been looking into your, I'm going to use Ayaka's example. I'm very interested in cybersecurity, the intersection of cybersecurity and the law. Uh, I've been looking into this XYZ program that you offer and ask them for a conversation. Say, you know, could I have, you know, 20 minutes of your time? to talk more about this program. So the reason I say have a goal, if it fits in that conversation, it's completely uh, suggested that you could say, it's my goal that by the end of the conversation, I know more about X, Y, Z, or it's my goal to go to this school and have you know this career work at this internship that's right next door to the school. Like you can, it is, kind of you to state explicitly what your goals are in talking to them. That way they know what you're trying to get at. And I hope, I don't know if I'm doing a good job at this, but when you do send an email, do not do any sort of like passive language or casualness in terms of even something, for example, of, I hope this email finds you well. You can actually switch that out with, I know you're busy and I appreciate your time. Uh, it's just be a little bit more direct. Try not to use flowery language and you don't have to be shy or beat around the bush the fact that you are applying to this school. Uh, so and, and instead of saying, I'm just checking in on the status, you could switch that up to, I'm, so, I'm very interested in this school. Um, practice it, practice it just with different emails and different language. Uh, if you're already really good at this, then this class is not for you. Uh, I am really talking to what I personally have seen over the last nine months in my experience is that minority women of color are writing passive emails and they are speaking with passive language. Um, instead of saying, you know, I'm very much so interested they say language like, you know, the next steps in my journey. And these sort of like passive ways of talking about, you know, wherever, wherever I may go, even in an essay or these sorts of like open ended. And I don't, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not um, a sociologist, but it's, it seems as though I'm seeing um, specifically women and women of color and minority women of color, like write emails or write language that has a softness or an open-endedness to it. Um, they're afraid to just state directly what they're interested in, what they're looking for and questions they have. And now if you're a minority woman of color, you're listening to this and you're thinking, that's not me. That's amazing. That's not you then. You know yourself best. I'm just trying to help um, people out. I know like me and what I've seen around. Uh, so also something to do when you're reaching out is please be yourself. This also fits in with the flowery language and the sort of passive voice that I've seen in emails to admissions officers when you're reaching out. You don't have to be overly formal. You don't have to act like you are speaking to the queen of England. Uh, so, you know what I actually did is I knew I had to write a few emails to admissions officers and I looked up interviews that that person had 
on YouTube, I watched an interview with them or I watched the way that the school's admissions officer interacted and I just mimicked sort of the language that they were already using. For example, Sean Adams in Texas uh, mentioned once in an interview that she doesn't like it when people interrupt her. Uh, and, you know, whereas uh, Rob Schwartz mentioned he, he prefers just to be called Rob. So that's how I went ahead and addressed them both. A little bit with a formality, a Southern politeness for Miss Adams and addressing Rob, knowing that he had openly said that that's how he prefers to be addressed. Um, so just watch a YouTube video. This goes into what I've already said. Please don't be casual with your ideas. If you are looking to check in and you want to write a continued letter of interest, say that you are still interested and that you're sending an email to show a continued interest. You can actually write that. You can say, you know, I'm writing to show continued interest. This is a clear uh, uh, sentence and it's what you're really doing. You know, um, you don't have to say, I hope this email finds you well. I am so grateful. Like, uh, kindness does a lot, but a lot of the extra fluff in order to try to make people feel more comfortable is not necessary. And do not, please do not write out your list of questions. Uh, pretty much, I don't want to say pretty much ever, but I would suggest you say, I have questions on, and you say the following topic, like um, job opportunities for 1Ls in their uh, spring semester. You could say something pointed like that. I, I have questions on the, and how I can get in touch with alumni presence in the state of Texas, if the school's in California. Um, say what your questions are about and ask them for a meeting. Please do not send, I would suggest not to send an email with 20 bullet pointed questions that you have. It's not uh, respectful of that person's time. And it can be done and you can develop a relationship with them on the phone or in a Zoom call. And if they say, no, I'm not offering meetings right now, you know, say, great, I, I actually have a list of questions. Would you mind taking a look at them? But please do not expect them to write back in length answers to every single one of your questions if you're writing them out in the email. You can ask them in person or face-to-face. Uh, um, Alyssa, I, I, I do want to interrupt you here a little bit. I'm sorry, I'm inter interrupting you a lot. Um, you know, we've we've talked to a couple admissions officers and, and people who are in the pro in in the admissions process and all of that. Um, these people are busy. These people are looking through a lot of emails, a lot of applications this year. You know, every single person we've talked to, it's always there's an uptick in applications this year, next cycle, probably the cycle after that. So really the directness is not to be rude. It's kindness of respecting their time, respecting your time. And, you know, working people know you don't want to read through a flowery, long email and to see the ask in the end. That is almost more rude than seeing that ask in the, at the top because you just made that person read through a huge email just to ask for a Zoom call, right? So, you know, think about who you're writing to, be respectful, be kind, all that. Yeah, Ayaka, you just nailed it. You absolutely just nailed it. And and I used to work for a company called Lululemon and they would make us have these radical conversations with both customers and business owners, gym owners on the street, in the community. Uh, it's basically an introvert's nightmare of just how much you uh, have to be talking with other people um, if you work on like on a retail floor there. And a trick that they actually taught me that does work is if I'm feeling unsure of how to go about writing an email or how to go about speaking with someone or having a conversation with them, uh, all I have to do is, is you can close your eyes if you want to, but take a deep breath and ask myself, what do I hope the end result of that conversation is. So for example, if I am asking to meet with an officer or I'm asking to meet with them for 20 minutes on a Zoom call so I can ask them questions about the intersection of 
cyber uh, cyber law and and the law, the cybersecurity and the law. And I want to know about how many students are really in those programs or in those clinics. Are those clinics, you know, eight students big or are they 100 students big? Is it something that I could, you know, spend my entire focus on during law school or is it more of like a supplementary focus? Um, you know, how many things like that. Um, I might be nervous or I might not know how to go about starting that conversation on email, but if I ask myself, what do I hope to achieve by the end of the conversation? It could be simple. I want them to say yes to a Zoom call with me or I want a Zoom call scheduled. That would be better. So if I say I want a Zoom call scheduled with them, I might even say, I know you're busy and I appreciate your time. You know, would, would it be all right to ask for a, to schedule a Zoom call with you? It was really just like two sentences. Would it be all right to ask if I can schedule a Zoom call with you? I have questions on this, you know, and then just sign, you know, sign off. Um, so like that. So Ayaka is completely correct in that. Things you can ask them, ask them if there are scholarship opportunities for high performing one else. Ask if you can be in contact with students. They might say, yes, here's a student's information. Or if they're a large school, they might say, you can go to our website and find webinars that students lead. Uh, ask them about how to request an application waiver. Sometimes though it says on their website, so make sure to do that. And something I really wanna talk about tonight is ED. Something I didn't know until I was doing a lot of interviews with admissions officers was how personal the decision for ED really is. And it was interesting because I did not know that ED is really best for someone who is prioritizing the school they're getting into over an extra savvy like financial planning. Um, so I've heard it twice now to, you know, let a rip on ED if you are not overly concerned with financial aid. Um, and that's because you won't receive uh, scholarship opportunities from other schools if you pull your application from those other schools if you're accepted. Um, that's my understanding of it. Ayaka, does that sound about right? Yeah, I, I think that sums it up of like, you know, you're using, it sounds like this uh, law school application really is yes, you're applying, but the acceptance letter is all is also a negotiation of where you've been accepted versus where you want to go versus how much it's all costing you. So really, if that cost part isn't the main concern, you know, if scholarships isn't the, the main thing you're going after, then probably early decision is, is a good choice. If you know which program you want to go to, you know which school you want to go to. It's not going to be as, as uh, Laura Hosted just mentioned, it's not going to be um, the the make it or break it, like it, it might be in undergrad. Right, it's, it's not gonna be that make it or break it. And also if you are interested in applying um, for a binding ED program, I would assume that you wanna do ED to that school because you like that school and what they have to offer so much. So if you like a school that much, you should 100% have had and are having conversations with their admissions officers. If you like a school that much, you should absolutely be speaking to an admissions officer uh, about it and have a conversation about ED, bring your stats. Uh, you know, if you have your numbers, say this is around my numbers. If you have softs, talk about your softs. I don't really have softs. So just if anyone hears that and gets scared, I don't have softs, so you're not alone. And uh, just talk about different things like that and talk about if it's really a great decision for you. You can ask, I don't think this is great, but you can look at what extracurriculars the school offers, offers uh, and if they have unique programs or clinics. Other things you should be thinking about and other people you should be contacting. Did you know that you should be applying for your FAFSA before you even get your acceptance anywhere? So sometimes the momentum stops at, okay, I got all my applications in and then I'm going to see where I got accepted and I'm gonna figure out how I'm going to pay for it. But I dropped a link right there of uh, admissions dean 
talking about um, in an interview, someone said, what can a student do after they send their application in and they haven't even gotten acceptance or rejected yet? Like someone's just sitting and waiting around. And he mentioned, you should absolutely be filling out your FAFSA. Uh, so that is for your financial aid. If you're needing financial aid, you should absolutely be doing that. Another just side um, tip that I wanted to leave everyone with is, uh, did you know that credit card debt can impact the amount of loans you can take out for your student loans? So something you want to also think about in your application process, and this is mostly for people that are out of undergrad or have been under, under, out of undergrad for a while, um, particularly because if you're in undergrad, the chances are you don't, ha you haven't had enough time to build up for credit. But if you have poor credit, uh, or even if you don't know if you have, something you really want to get intimate and familiar with is contact your credit companies and grab your credit reports. You don't want to be surprised when you're trying to pull out loans uh, when you're actually trying to do that. Law school is stressful enough. So apply for your FAFSA before you even get accepted anywhere. And grab your credit reports and figure out if you or need to do anything to maybe make your credit a little bit higher and just make sure that you're not going to be surprised when you're trying to pull out student loans. And those are just the side tips I wanted to leave for everyone tonight. The link, my email is right here, Alyssa at ElsaUnplugged.com. You can also email Ayaka uh, at Ayaka at ElsaUnplugged.com. Um, and you can reach us both at admissions at ElsaUnplugged.com. That's really all I have for tonight. I don't have um, people in the class with me right now asking questions, but you can absolutely email us. I'll just throw that up one more time. You can email us right there. If you're listening to this on the current website uh, platform is Kajabi. If you're listening to this on the, on the course, uh, please email us. If you're listening to this and you're not in the course, please email us and ask, ask us questions. A lot of times people ask me questions that I will say, let's figure out how to write an email to admissions. For example, they'll say, I want to submit my application on this date, but my LSAT's on this date and the deadline's on this date. What do I do? And all I say is please reach out to admissions and just talk to them directly about that. Uh, the last thing I wanted to bring up today, and, and I should have brought it up a lot sooner, is just uh, if you are trying to take your LSAT and get your applications in and make a very well-informed decision for yourself and your future, it may take longer than two to three months. Even a six-month time period is crunched. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you really, if you give yourself more time, you have the ability to really tailor your very expensive education to yourself. And I would really suggest that. Um, it comes across me pretty often that people are not even having conversations with admissions officers because they're just trying so hard to get their application in as fast as possible. And I just want to throw this out there, suggest we try next cycle, you know, and you can apply early, which makes you and puts you in a much better position for financial aid and for acceptance. And when you see a due date for a school's application, please do not write your essays about a week before the due date, or do not think to yourself that you're going to apply on or by that due date please apply a little bit earlier because you owe it to yourself um, unless there's outstanding circumstances. But I would just want to give everyone that two cents and consider applying early the next cycle if it could position you better. That's all I have for tonight. Ayaka, do you have anything you wanted to add? I thought that was, you know, all correct, all brilliant insight. Um, you know, you and I see a couple of requests um, every couple of weeks of, you know, like my application, I'm turning in my application next week. Can you take a look? And more times than not, that process has been rushed. And, you know, every admissions officer or anyone who is in that admissions game, they all say, you know, you need to take a lot of time to really put your application together, not just studying for the LSAT, right? Your, your essay does matter. Diversity statement does matter. Um, thoughtful resume matters. It's it all matters. Um, even if you have the best stats in the world, it it all matters. So, take the time, do yourself a service, and you know, 
this is not just the next three years. Um, this is really, a, and this might land better for people who've been out of undergrad for a little bit, but it is a big decision, right? It's a career, it might be on the same trajectory of a career that you're looking for, but it's still a career change. Um, you know, you're, you're paying a lot of money. You're also not making money during those three years. So it's, it, it's a commitment and you really want to do that thoughtfully and really there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of false information out there, um, but really reaching out to admissions will get you, you the right information for the right school for you. You said it beautifully. I got nothing else. And I want to say thank you to everyone. And thanks for joining LSAT Unplugged. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.